but essentially in terms of the the broad overview so we already um before spring break you know essentially we went over just to just to kind of recap here uh we went over this sort of the, what i'm calling the jones taxonomy where we think about okay what's just like a an aggregate way to describe uh the production function for new ideas and if we want to start endogenizing uh, technology moving beyond the, the Ramsey uh, model. Okay, so, um, and that's, our, that's what's called the, this first semi-endogenous step where we say, okay, well, there's no real choices involved, but we're at least going to have a notion of the production function for ideas, taking existing ideas, combining that with research efforts, um, and then, uh, you know, producing new ideas. Okay, so maybe I can, let me jump over the notes. Okay, so I, I, I have like a window here where we can look at the notes. Um, so that was, you know, basically here, this, this production function for new ideas. Okay. Um, and, uh, so yeah, and you can solve it. And then the, the major implication there is that, uh, ultimately, um, you need to have, because research gets more difficult over time, because you get those low, low hanging fruit first, uh, in order to sustain long run growth, you actually do need growth in the inputs to research, which generally we think of as, as research people doing research. And so you need population growth uh, to sustain long run growth. Okay, so that's sort of implication number one. And then implication number two is um, in terms of the long run growth, it's, you know, changing the fraction of people that you devote to research, for instance, isn't going to change your, your long run growth. Okay, so it's going to have short, some short run effect, but that's get, because research gets harder over time that gets dissipated into a level effect and then the long run growth is the same basically. Okay. So that's sort of, okay. That's, that's just like a way to classify different models. Okay. And then we can go back when, when we, when we specify for these later models, our production function for new ideas, we can say, okay, what's the five for this model? What's the eta for this model? And what are the implications? Okay. Um, and then the big thing with the Jones taxonomy is that what I just said earlier, those two facts are true for any phi between zero and one. Okay, when this thing here is between zero and one. Uh, but then when you enter that phi equals one case, um, you, you start being able to influence growth with policy. Okay, and, but the cost is that you actually can't have population growth. Okay, which is a little bit weird. Okay, so, so it's sort of like, um, you need to, the big thing is deciding whether you're in phi equals one land or you, whether you're in phi less than one land. Okay, so, so went through that. Okay, that's sort of input number one. Input number two is this product market result, which ends up being pretty useful generally. Okay, which is, you know, you're just thinking about a firm that's facing some demand function, or in this case, an inverse demand function, P of Y, that says, okay, if we produce Y and we want to sell all of that, how much, what price are we going to get uh, for each of those units? Okay. Um, and does, does, in this setup here, it doesn't matter where P of Y is coming from. You know, it's just a general thing, but but we'll see where it comes from later. Um, then you can write down a sort of a profit function where you have revenue. And here it's specified as a wage, a labor cost, but really it could be, and you know, W could be whatever your marginal cost is. Okay. Um, and it's just assuming a unit production function. Okay. So, um, in this setting, you know, W could could represent as a general marginal cost. Okay, so we go through, and eventually we find that um, that your markup, your price over the marginal cost, your markup over marginal cost, is going to be some function of just the elasticity of demand. Okay, so we assume that a man, that demand or inverse demand has constant elasticity, and once you assume that constant elasticity, then you get this constant markup result. Okay, so um, and that's useful because, well, first of all, we're gonna we end up getting constant elasticities a lot um, in our demand functions, uh, the way we set things up, uh, and also, you know, the markup over cost is essentially gonna give you profit. Okay, and profit's what we're interested in because we want to know how much are these firms making, how much do they value having a new product line, and hence how much are they gonna invest in generating new product lines, which is the the driver of growth in this setting. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's all sort of recap. Okay. And then we go through, um, the, uh, the first model, you know, we did was this expanding varieties model. Okay. And kind of just to give you an idea of, um, 
what are the uh, major components of all of these models? Okay, so there's like a, a fixed number of kind of important decisions that you need to make about an endogenous growth model. Okay, uh, usually, you know, with, within this class of endogenous growth models. Okay, so um, the first one that we usually do is the, the what's called the aggregation function here. Okay, so in this case, it's um, a CES aggregation of a bunch of different products. Okay, um, and so, you know, sort of embedded in that is sort of like, what's the elasticity of substitution between those? Okay, and here it's fairly general because it's CES. Uh, and so it's just going to be some function of epsilon. Um, and then the other thing is sort of like, okay, are you, what's, what's your driver of growth? Is it going to be the fact that the number of varieties in this case, N is expanding, um, or is it going to be, uh, that you have a fixed number of varieties as in the Schumpeterian model, but you get better and better at producing those. Okay. So that's, that's the sort of the, the aggregation choice. Okay. Um, and then the other big thing kind of is just your production function for ideas as we as we just discussed. So um, how exactly that's set up, does it use labor as an input? Does it use sort of just final good as an input? Does it use some kind of capital? Okay, so how all of that, what are the inputs to new ideas is is the other sort of big thing, okay? Um, everything we do in the endogenous growth space sort of for now is gonna be like different variations on that, okay? And so there are gonna be some variations that we don't do. It's like, okay, we didn't do Schumpeterian model where you use um, I don't know where you use final good as an input for research. Okay. So, but we're going to do enough that you're going to be kind of bored of, of looking at these different variations by the end. Okay. So, um, and then you can kind of interpolate it, uh, what, what the, the stuff we don't do is going to look like, or maybe more likely you'll end up doing it on a homework or something. Okay. So, um, that's sort of the landscape of models here. And I think that's important to, to keep in the back of your mind. Okay. So, um, Okay, and then so yeah, so for expanding varieties for Romer, okay, we 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 basically can can actually can do you guys remember? I'm having trouble remembering precisely uh, where we left off uh, last time. Does anyone have sort of just like the last thing that we did um, in the last class? Okay, we got W and GW, and that was in expanding varieties. Or do we start? Do we start with Schumpeter? Okay, in expanding variety. Okay, so um, all right, so uh, okay, so let's let's. Okay, so here, so basically, yeah, so essentially, I think it seems like we got here. And then we're starting down towards this road. Okay, so let's let's try and um, let me just. Okay, so so but essentially, okay, so I'm, I'll probably just back up to the. Uh, uh, okay, all right, cool. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so let's let's. Okay, so we're. I mean, in the end, we're going to have to sort of establish a, a few things. Okay, essentially. Um, looking at the uh, uh, the free entry condition. Okay, so I mean, when you're solving this, if you want to think about this as sort of a, you know, a step by step or sort of, you know, um, you know what's the what's the starting point? It's essentially the free entry condition at the end of the day. It's not, it's not your starting point, but that's sort of like, that's like the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, once you once you have free entry condition, it's just a matter of subbing, substituting in things that you know about the value and everything like that until you get to uh, what you're looking for. Okay, so um, so let's do that. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, we've got kind of like three modes that I have here. So there's like the, just me in the spaceship lecturing mode. Uh, there's the looking at the notes mode, and then I'm gonna have like a, a whiteboard mode here um, where we can uh, oops, look at, uh, yep, whiteboard, um, and I can draw stuff. Okay, so, um, all right, so then, okay, so let's see, got my, okay. All right, so, uh, yeah, so we're gonna have expanding varieties, okay. Um, 
handwriting is uh, at least for like writing text is like not so good on this but um for math stuff it's i don't think it's that bad okay but if it starts if it's too small it's too big if it's just totally unlegible just let me give me a quick heads up in the chat um and i can i can like make myself better okay um they gave me this little glove that like makes it easier to write okay so i'm just going to put that on real quick um where your hand can like slide more easily. Okay, so um, all right, so the so basically the you know our free entry condition is what so 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 for the and remember for the free entry condition, we need to think about uh, what is um, essentially you know what what is your production function for new ideas? Okay, and so in this case, our production function for new ideas is going to look like uh, essentially. So this this is you know we 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 got into this. A little bit in the class is you know are we talking about an aggregate production function are we talking about sort of like you know individual firms and then an arbitrary number can enter and essentially because of linearity it, it doesn't really matter okay so i'm going to write it down in the aggregate but you can think about it either way okay so first you're going to have some constant okay usually that's going to be gamma because that's what we kind of use in the jones taxonomy um and then you have your dependence on uh, existing technology, okay, and so here this is where we ha we're essentially saying that phi equals one, okay, um, in in this dependence. Okay, so here we have n instead of a, but you know implicitly there's a one here, so that's phi equals one, and then uh, your dependence on research inputs. Okay, so here R represents actual labor. Okay, so we were in in the in the abstract case we were not specific, but here R is is the amount of labor. Okay, so. Um, you know, implicitly, this means that phi and eta are one. Okay, so that's that's our production function for new ideas. Um, okay, and then in the background, you know, we have uh, that our like research labor plus, produ plus production labor is is equal to one. Okay, so in general, and I think I switched this in the in the recent notes change. In general, we could have like this equaling L or something like that, and we'd get an L showing up in a bunch of places. And and that can be interesting, but it, I decided it was it's not worth carrying around an L. We can just assume we have a unit mass of people. The only question is what fraction are we putting into research, and what fraction are we putting into population? Okay. Now, when we talk about scale effects later on, it might be useful to reintroduce L, but for now, we can just do it in the simplest way possible. Okay. Um, all right. So then, the uh, okay. So that's our production function for new ideas. Okay. So then, if you want to think about a free entry condition, okay, you're just thinking about sort of like one new additional entrant okay so you're increasing r a little bit okay and if you increase r a little bit you're going to get you know gamma times n more new products okay each of these new products is has some value v okay uh so that's going to be um essentially that's going to be our like marginal benefit okay here all right uh and then the marginal cost is just you have to pay them a wage w okay that's marginal cost. Okay, so that's going to be our, our free entry condition there, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and again, the the assumption on the wage is that the 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 researchers get paid the same amount as as production workers, which which essentially means that you can freely switch between those two. You don't have to go to school or anything like that. Okay, obviously it's, that's that's an approximation, um, but you, you can you can there are certainly models where you can loosen that approximation and you have to have people training to do research and that's how that's going to be more realistic but it's also going to be more complicated so you know um for now we're just going to do the simplest uh that we can okay um all right so then uh okay um what am i saying in the notes okay so so uh what do we know kind of in the background okay uh, so we know things about V basically. Okay. So I'll just write, I'll write sort of stuff that we've already derived over on the side over here. So, so we know for V basically that that's going to be some discounted form, uh, of profit. So when we worked out the value function. Uh, we ultimately found that that was going to be pi divided by, uh, R minus the growth rate of V. Okay. And that's, um, that's that that basically comes from you know if our, our specification for the value function looked like this okay all right and if you divide by v you're gonna get this okay 
And then if you solve for V itself, again, noting that this here is, is the growth rate of V, you're going to get this expression, okay? Um, all right, and so we can, for, you know, we can leave it at that for now, okay? We, we haven't figured out what GV is going to be. Okay, it's going to be related to uh, G pi, okay, which we also discussed last time, sort of amusingly. Um, and uh, it, so, so we can work through that, okay? Um, but for now, we can just leave that as is, okay? And so, um, right, so then, uh, yeah, so then we can, you know, that, so, so the rest of the stuff is just going to be sort of like repeated substitutions into our free entry condition until we're at a point where we can actually conclude something. And we're going to, our primary object of interest here is, is essentially R, okay? So, you know, it could be R, and, you know, I like to think of it as R, it could, you know, if you do, if you know P, you know R, if you know R, you know the growth rate. So it's like, you can do it a bunch of different ways. I like to think about it as just a, a big societal choice about how much um, uh, people are you putting into research versus production, because that's, that's the main choice that we're making. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So then, uh, all right. So now, okay. So there's sort of like a couple different unknowns here. We don't really know pi. Okay. We're, yeah, I mean, we do know, but we're, we haven't subbed it in yet. So we need to know pi, and we need to know w, and we need to know gv, okay? So um, here, uh, you can, uh, you can, you can, you can, you know, we have found all of this stuff, okay? So we have found what is, uh, what is pi, what is w, and all of that, okay? Um, and we can sub in, okay? Um, but, uh so I mean, basically, it turns out that um, you can, you can find the ratio uh, of pi to w. Okay, phi is just an assumption. That's that's correct. Uh, so the question is, phi equals eta equals one is an assumption. Yeah. So that's just saying, here's this is our production function for for new ideas. We're just we're just asserting that. Okay. Um, and you know we 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 assert that particular form. You know for you know for for a particular purpose, which is that it gives a, it, the model sort of works out, everything balances, and we get a reasonable answer. Okay, so um, you you could uh, yeah. So when we when we start, we're gonna look at variations on that. Okay, because essentially uh, when you when you write down this model with with a general population, you'll we'll see that the growth rate actually increases with population. So if you have a larger population, you have a larger growth rate, okay? Because there's sort of scale effects. Um, and so that can, that can be a problem. So we can essentially go in and say, okay, well, what if there was a phi here? Okay, what if we had some general phi here? Can we still make it work? And it turns out you can, okay, um, and you, you get a different answer, uh, but it, you can make that work as well. So if we're gonna start out by just looking at the phi equals one case, and then we'll generalize to the, to the arbitrary phi case later on, okay? Um, all right, so then, um, okay, so yeah, so so now working with this um, uh, here, so we essentially we need to know pi and w, okay? Um, those are gonna be objects of interest. Um, now, uh, it, you know, it, it, and in some sense, it makes, so, so we're gonna be able to find the ratio of pi to w, okay? So if, if you wanna think about it, um, like, uh, uh, you know, to divide GV equals uh, W over pi. Okay, so we're gonna be able to find this ratio of, of pi to W, and then after that, it's gonna be working with relatively simple stuff, okay? Um, and so, it, you know, it's a little, maybe it's a, it's a little arbitrary to say, okay, well, why, we, why pi over W, why not something else, okay? Um, it, it, there is some intuition here in the sense that you think about what what are the types of income in this economy? Okay, there's no capital, all right? Basically, there's no no solo style capital as we would think of it, okay? There are firms, okay, and those firms are owned by people. So in the sense of like financial capital, yeah, there is. Um, and, and those firms are, have to be created with costly investment and they generate flows of income in the future. So they, <clears throat> the firms kind of look like capital, but they're more like, um, intellectual capital or knowledge capital than physical capital, okay? But at the end of the day, the two sources of income in the model are labor, the wage from labor, uh, and profits from firms, okay? So these are two sources of income, and 
we're, we're essentially going to see that you know those the, the shares for each of those sources of income are going to be kind of constant in in gdp and so then their ratio is also going to be constant right so wage is going to be like some wage total wage bill is going to be some fraction of gdp total profit bill is going to be the the remaining fraction okay um and so the uh that ratio should just be some constant okay so that's that's the intuition about why why we expect to find uh, a constant ratio here okay so that what i said isn't exactly 100 percent true because one little caveat which is that if you think about what is the total wage bill in the economy we've assumed that um let's see so we have well yeah we've assumed that um labor is one okay and then even then uh the uh the amount of production labor is p okay so so we really we would want like wp here okay and then for profits, the other thing to keep in mind is this is profit, pi is profit per firm, okay? Total profit, we would want like an N here, okay? So so this isn't quite a ratio of, of income shares, okay? But we could we could turn it into one if we want, okay? We could say, all right, well, um, let me move laterally here. We could say, okay, well, the N, we can get that from over here. We can move that over here and then just multiply a P on top, okay? So we're going to get gamma P divided by R minus GV. Okay, and then over here, we got that extra P, and down here, we've moved the N like that. Okay, so now this is total production labor uh, income, and this is total sort of capital or, um, you know, per profit in income. Okay, so this is something we, we really would expect to, to have a constant ratio, okay, just from sort of things that we know about macro. All right, so um, that's kind of... That's kind of the intuition for, for using that shortcut. You can still go through and just plug in, hard, you know, just just like brute force plug in stuff and, and it'll um, it'll work out, but but it's a little bit easier just to do this, okay? Uh, all right, so now, okay, so now before, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invoke what we found about profits before just because I don't wanna do too much backtracking here. I just wanna do like a little bit. So before we found, um, from the firm's problem, okay, uh, that essentially um, intuition for the right hand side, okay. Uh, so that that you're you're saying on on the new equation, this this uh, the new right hand side, um, yeah. So uh, so so what we're gonna find, and let me let me write this out, and then we'll, we'll see why we're gonna find that. So when we when we Two profits, that's an epsilon, okay, uh, times P over N. Okay, so essentially, like, just because um, we find they do a mar constant markup over marginal cost, and we know what they're using for their inputs, uh, we eventually, so th yeah, we eventually find that these these are their profits, okay? So um, this, this is essentially a result of the fact that um, P is equal to epsilon over epsilon minus one times this is that constant markup thing where, where w is their marginal cost um and then uh uh what their their sort of input yi or y or whatever uh is going to be p over n okay so if you combine all that together subtract off w you, you end up getting this okay so uh, but the intuition for the right hand side um so the i mean the so the intuition for why why would we expect that to be constant essentially what um let me see if i have this in the notes we, we eventually you know if you think about you know wp um that's the the total amount of income uh that is generated by uh production labor okay um so We, we can find, so that, let me just work through this. So then, and then N pi is the total amount of income uh, generated from firm profits. Okay. We essentially can find that these are, these are constant fractions of GDP. Okay. Um, let me see if I have, uh, it's, it's a little bit of algebra to work through. Okay. But um, I'm pretty sure I have this, 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 this uh, available in the notes somewhere. So one second. So essentially, 
yeah, I have it. Okay, so what we find is um, that WP is epsilon over epsilon minus one times uh, total. So GDP in this in this model we're, we're just calling C, you know, the capital Y. It's going to equal capital Y because uh, people just they just consume what's produced. Okay, so so in this case we're seeing that that total wage bill is this epsilon minus one over epsilon fraction of uh, uh, you know total of GDP. So you know if you want to think about it like the ratio here, that's like the labor share and some this is like the labor share is is this which is also you know this is like one minus one over epsilon okay so if epsilon is greater than one this is some number between zero and one uh that tells us what's the what's the labor share now this is the production labor share so it's not the true labor share but it's the production labor share um and then with regards to profits okay well i mean essentially we we know the answer has to be because the rest of uh uh, basically the, the remainder that's not going to labor is going to go to profits. Okay. So it's going to be one over epsilon and you can show that. Um, I don't know if I don't have that explicitly written in the notes because it's, it's, you can derive it, um, from, uh, yeah, you, you can derive, derive it very quickly from, from what's explicitly written in the notes. Okay. So, or in other words, this says that N pi over C is equal to one over epsilon. Okay. So, um, and that, so, so that's saying, okay, both of these things have our, our constant shares, okay, of, of income. And so then, you know, just sort of take, take these two equations, okay, we could just, we could just do it right from here and say, okay, well then what is WP over N times pi? That's going to be this thing here divided by this thing. So the, those epsilons will cancel and you'll get epsilon minus one. Okay. So that's the intuition is they both have constant share. They both represent a constant share of income. And so then when you divide them, you're just going to get some constant, which is the ratio of those, those income shares. Okay. Um, all right. So that, yeah, so that actually sets us up pretty well for, for, for this. Okay. So then we can keep moving here and say, okay, well, the left-hand side, that's going to be the same for now. And then uh, the right-hand side now we know is just epsilon minus one. Okay. So, so that, that, this so this one stayed the same. The right hand side, because what we did over here, we know is just just epsilon minus one. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, okay. So now we need to think about GV. Okay. So GV is a little bit. It's a little bit of a hassle. Okay. Um, let's see. Now we can, um, just working off the notes here. Okay, so so to, to find GV, uh, we kind of, let me see what the best way to do this is. Uh, so we can, I'm trying to figure out actually what I was doing in the notes, but uh, okay. So here's here's how we're gonna do GV. Um, th and actually, th this is something I didn't do last time that I realized I, I forgot to to go through, which is um, there's the question of do you just say okay we're in BGP, we don't care about we don't care about dynamics, we're just trying to find the BGP. Uh, and let's let's find that and, and make it simple, okay? Or do you say, okay, well, we might not be in BGP. Let's see. Let's allow for the possibility of dynamics and see what happens, okay? So in this model, um, it turns out that there are never dynamics, okay? Because there's no, there's, you know, this n is there's no obvious scale to n. So wherever you are in n space, it's just you're just lost out there, right? And you keep moving. Um, so uh, it turns out there are no dynamics now. So then if you, if you just assume BGP, it turns out that that's a correct assumption that you just start in BGP and you find it, you're going to get the right answer, but you, maybe it's fun. You know, we're, we're, we're technical folks here. We want to do things the, the right way, uh, and say, okay, well, let's not assume BGP and actually prove BGP. Okay. And so we can do that. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, here's how we're going to do it now. 
in general, okay, if you're saying, if we want to know, well, what's, what's the growth rate of V, okay, then we would say, all right, well, um, from up here, we know that V is uh, pi over R minus GV, so then we need the growth rate of pi minus the growth rate of this thing, which also includes GV, and it's like, okay, that's, um, that's not necessarily ideal, okay? Um, the other thing you can do is, is try and work from uh, maybe this equation here, okay, and say, well, GV is equal to R minus pi over V, okay, and that, that's a possibility, but it's, it's a little bit circular, okay? Um, but one thing you can do, all right, is, and this, this, the only thing you need to assume here is that you actually have positive levels of research, which we're going to be assuming throughout. Um, one thing you can do is uh, look over here, okay, um, and say, okay, well, this is our Francher condition. It says that at every single point in time, W is equal to gamma times N times V, okay? And so we can actually just take the growth rate of this thing, which is true at every instant of time, and it's still going to be true, okay? Anything that's true over time, right, you can take the growth rate and it's still going to be true, okay? So that's cool, um, and that's useful, okay? So then if we do that, just work through each term, you know, uh, so this is, uh, you know, from the uh, free entry condition, not the Federal Election Commission. Um, what are we going to get if, if we take the growth rate? Uh, Jacob, is it really true at every instant of time? Yes. So, so it's, um, it's, yeah, it's only going to be true in equilibrium. That's true. Okay. So we're assuming, we're assuming equilibrium. We're not assuming kind of steady state BGP stuff, right? So we're, we're, we're always going to be assuming that we're in equilibrium. But we're in, and and so it's that everything is going to adjust over time. The question is, are there dynamics? Okay, um, and and so what we're going to do is, we, yes, assume equilibrium, but we're not going to assume steady state. Uh, we're going to allow for potential dynamics. Okay, and so the dynamics here generally are going to be that maybe it's not just you start out with a certain R and you keep going forever, although you do, it turns out. Maybe R starts a little low and it goes high. Maybe it starts a little high and goes low until it converges. Okay, so. Um, we're going to allow for basically R or things that depend on R to be moving around. Okay. But we, we are going to always assume equilibrium at, at every point in time. Okay. Um, yeah. If, if you start entertaining zero growth situations, then yeah. Um, so is it, so it's, um, it is, this is always a little bit of a point of confusion. I've, you know, we had this last year too. What do, what, what do we mean when we say BGP? Okay, and it, it's always a little bit vague. Okay, so the best the best way to say it is it should just be explicit and say, okay, BGP, BGP is kind of like things are approximately balanced. They might take a little bit of time to, to converge to fixed values, but the sort of that things are set up and normalized in the right way. Okay, so so the safest way to say it is that it's it's sort of both BGP it's to specifically say steady state if you want to have steady state. Okay, so here we're, we're saying, are we saying BGP? That's a little bit vague. That's that's not always 100% certain, but we're saying we are we are in equilibrium, but we're not necessarily in steady state. Okay, um, so so yeah, I mean, you could say it's BGP, but not SS, I guess. Maybe I'll just concede the point there. You could say it's it's sort of BGP-like, and but we're not fully converged to, to steady state. Okay, and we'll see, we'll, we'll see in a second what that's going to look like. All right. Um, Okay, so then let me, well, I'll, I'll write this out first and then we can scroll. Uh, so what what if we growthify the Francher condition? So gamma's not doing anything. N is going to grow at rate G, okay? Uh, v is going to grow at rate GV. Okay, so G is, is assumed to be G, the growth rate of N. Uh, and then this is going to be G, dub, not GC. Well, actually, it's going to be turned turn to be the same, but uh, it's going to be GW. All right. Um, okay, so that's that's sort of one step, and that actually simplifies things quite a bit. All right, um, and now let's think about what is GW, okay, other than George Washington. So, uh, well, okay, so we have we have an expression lying around for W, okay, and in fact it's right over here, okay. Uh, so let's. Let's kind of invoke that. Okay, so and if you want to make it like a, a real proper function, then it's epsilon over epsilon minus one over epsilon times 
c over p okay that's p there okay um all right so so it's some constant times uh the ratio of, of output and uh uh the labor okay so um we can work with that all right we can work with that um and, and you know this 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 kind of um makes sense which is saying you know uh the more production labor is there is out there the lower the uh the wage is going to be okay so or or you can think about as uh if you if you flip things around you can think about as the higher the wage the less production so it's it's sort of like a demand for labor kind of equation okay um all right so then if we use that what's gw it's just gc gw is going to be gc minus gp all right so it's going to be gc minus and i'm going to write this as just p dot over p for now okay um or maybe i won't let's Let's keep it as GP, but eventually we're gonna we're gonna unpack it. Okay, but I guess for now let's just call it GP, right? Okay, so then, um, cool. All right, so that's I'm gonna scroll now. Um, so that's our one equation. We can we can we can work with this even more. Okay, because we know what GC is, right? We just look at that tattoo on our forearm and say, oh, uh, you know, R minus G is equal to discount rate, or conversely. R is equal to the discount rate, which we're going to call rho plus GC. Okay, so um, you know, let's I'll continue with the sort of like dual pane kind of thing. So we know from Euler equation that uh, R is equal to rho plus GC. Okay, or if you want to flip it around, GC equals uh, R minus rho. Okay, so that's from the whole consumer side that we're just sort of taking as given and um, under the assumption that we have log utility. Okay. Uh, all right. So it's so GC is equal to R minus rho. So that's cool because then we can plug that in here. Okay. So take the left, the full left-hand side. And then the right-hand side is going to be, okay, is, uh, wait, do we want to do that? All right, why did I do that? I don't. Maybe maybe I'm. Um, uh, let me think here. No, why? I don't, I don't know why I did that. That was that was like backwards. But um, we there, there's actually a better way. Okay. Uh, which is. Let me see if I can get this right. Yeah, let me let me make sure that I'm doing this right. Sorry, folks, we're having some technical difficulties here. Uh, okay, let's um. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I sorry. Backtrack slightly. I tried to be too clever. Slash, not clever enough. Um, okay. So, so, so actually, what we really want to do is say, okay, we did this. Okay, before we went down that that silly little road, I tried to just go down there um, with the Euler equation. What does this imply about GV? Okay, that means it's GC minus GP minus g okay um and then we're just gonna plug that in to find this so at the end of the day we wanted to find this denominator here r minus gv okay okay um and so that's going to be if we use this line here that's going to be r minus gc okay which is a thing now we can use the earlier equation uh plus gp plus g okay all right um okay and so now if we want to the, the the last final form of the Euler equation we could say is that r minus gc is equal to rho okay so this is going to be rho here plus g plus gp okay um Okay, so that's and that comports with the notes, so that's always good. Um, all right, so that's that's our, our uh, 
denominator up here, r minus gb. Okay, so now we sort of know that, and we can plug it in. Okay, so this is r minus gb. Okay. Um, all right. So now, just to to kind of keep track of like what 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 uh, what's underlying all this stuff. Okay. So rho is a constant. G is is we'll see. It's just going to be simple function of r, and this is the growth rate of p, and that's we're going to leave that as is for now. Okay. So let's um, draw a line here and pick up again our friend or uh, working through the French condition. Okay. So Keep the reentry condition itself. Okay, so here uh, we're gonna have gamma p over rho plus g plus gp is equal to epsilon minus one. Okay, so um, all right. So now we're we're kind of almost there, right? Uh, we the only thing we really need to to do is sub in for g. Okay, so what is g? Okay, that's the growth rate of n. Okay, now let me just scroll up here to the beginning. Uh, this is our production function for ideas, okay? And so this also implies that G, which is the growth rate of N, is just gamma times R, okay? So here the, the growth rate is just some simple, is a linear function of R. The more research you put in, the more growth you get, okay? So that's going to be... Um, Let's go, let's go right here. Uh, that's going to be uh, pretty simple here. Okay, so gamma P rho plus uh, gamma R. Now, now GP, I'm going to just write as P dot over P is equal to epsilon minus one. Okay, so now, um, well, I mean, kind of the goal here all right, is to get everything in terms of one variable so that we can solve for the dynamics of that one variable. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, we have things in terms of R or P. Okay, but we know that that P is just one minus R and vice versa. Okay, so we can um, we can uh, easily make that substitution and then we're going to be kind of golden. All right. Um, okay, and so, you know, I guess it's probably uh, easier to Let's see, okay, so gamma uh, p is equal to. So first, let's just you know multiply over this to the other side. Okay, so this is going to be this is just multiplying over here. Okay, and then the next step is saying okay, well now we know that p is one minus r. Okay, so we have gamma one minus r. Okay, now here we have rho, gamma r, we're good on that. Um, now this thing, uh, what is this? Okay, so, right, so then remember that p is one minus r, so then p dot is just minus r dot. Okay, so this is gonna be minus r dot over one minus r, okay? Um, Okay, and so that's uh, you know that's basically going to be our, our equation there. Um, let me make sure that I'm 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 doing fine here. Okay, so um, yeah, all right, we're good. So uh, okay, so now um, now it, this is not the prettiest equation in the world, all right? Um, but we can we can simplify it a little bit, okay? And then, oh, sorry, do I miss that? How do we get g? Uh, is there a timestamp on this? No timestamp. Maybe there is. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know if I just missed this or not. But so, do I just uh, uh, okay? Ten, cool. All right. So um, so how do we get this? the g equals r times gamma. So so that's, um, if we go back up here, uh, so this is this is our production function for ideas here, okay? This is that phi equals eight equals one. Um, if you look at, if you just fit, calculate g from this, the growth rate of n is gonna be n dot over n, just dividing this n here, 
you're going to get that equal to to gamma times r. Okay, so it's just uh, re reformulating that the uh, production function for ideas. Okay. Um, ah. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. I will do that. Um, is that something I can? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Let me let me try and do that really quick so that we can we can take advantage of that as soon as possible. Pass follow delay. Mm, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Um, I will do that. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm seeing. Yeah, I'm seeing the chat settings. I'm not seeing that. Maybe non-mod settings. Ah, here we go. There we go. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, show timestamps. Expanding varieties. Are you using ideas and varieties interchangeably? Yeah. So yeah, that I am. Uh, every every new variety is sort of one idea, and so. Um, yeah, so you you know another way to to maybe me to be more clear is just to instead of calling it the production function for new ideas, call it the production function for new varieties. That that would be the I think the more correct way to say it because it you know it could be that you need a bunch of ideas for for a particular variety. Okay, and you know um, so it, it's you know in the real world, yeah, it's it's pretty complex. So yeah, I'll use it interchangeably probably just because I'm used to it. But um, yeah, in general, it, it's it's most precise to say the production function for new varieties. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So here we have uh, a little bit of an imposing expression here, but you know, it's essentially it's, it's a differential equation, right? It's a differential equation that um, if we solve it for this, we're going to get R dot equals something. That's a function of R. Okay. So it's going to be a law of motion for R uh, and that, we can we can basically work with okay so um, let's see uh, all right so we can I don't know what's the best way to, to to do this so so there's a little bit of uh, algebra here that we need to, to work out um, how should we do this so, so I mean in some sense we can just do this sort of the brute force way uh, you know on the left Let's just let's just fact because because some of this stuff is going to cancel like a, there's going to be a gamma r minus gamma r that's going to cancel so there's going to be a little bit of canceling not a ton okay we can factor this here epsilon minus one times rho plus uh, epsilon minus one times gamma r okay and then uh, yeah minus Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, from here. Okay. So so where the they, they can't what canceling are we going to get? Um, so here we have a minus gamma r. Okay. And then here we also have that that one part of a minus uh, gamma r. Okay. So uh, let's let's move all let's move all this stuff over to the left. So we're going to get gamma minus epsilon minus one is rho, and then we're going to be left with like a minus uh, epsilon gamma r, okay? Um, that's right. And then uh, that's going to be equal to minus epsilon minus one times r over one minus r. Okay, so that's, uh, okay. Okay, it's sort of like a, sorry, continuous, sort of like a pagination thing, which is not really necessary for our purposes, but it insists on having pages. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so so then we're gonna get this expression here. So now you can kind of see what we're, what we're gonna end up with is like a quadratic form. Okay, so we're gonna end up with something, um, we're gonna end up with something sort of like this side you can imagine setting r so that this thing ends up being zero it's going to be like gamma minus epsilon minus one row over epsilon gamma so you can imagine there's a there's a point where you can set this to zero okay and that's going to ultimately that's going to be our answer okay um but we can uh you know we can we can we can write it out a little bit more formally okay so here um you know we can multiply through okay and get that uh 
actually. So let's, let's keep that here. Okay. And we're going to get our dot is equal to what? Um, one minus r times gamma is one minus one row. Okay. So we're going to get some sort of not super pretty expression. Okay. But essentially, this is. Um, this is a quadratic form. Okay, so this is saying uh, our dot is equal to the product of two terms, okay? And they're both like linear terms, okay? So this one has the obvious solution, r equals one. Okay, so when r equals one, r dot is zero, and that's gonna be a, f a fixed point in some sense, okay? Although we'll, we'll see that it might be problematic, okay? Um, and then the other fixed point would be, you know, whatever solves this. So like our, you know, there's gonna be some, uh, what we're going to call our star, okay, which which is what solves this. So that'd be gamma minus epsilon minus one rho over epsilon times gamma. Okay, so that's, um, uh, sorry, that's right. Okay, so then, um, so that's going to be our sort of our star, okay. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's basically going to be a quadratic form and you can, if you, if you go sort of all the way and simplify, okay, I'm not going to go through all the algebra, but it's, um, this, you know, you can, you can verify it if you want, um, uh, after class. So, but basically if you go through and simplify, you're going to get something like this. So, so essentially what you do is, uh, you know, sort of factor out some stuff. And you can eventually make it look like a proper quadratic form. Okay, so then this would be r minus r star. Okay, so you factor out like a gamma, basically you factor out this gamma epsilon here, and you just divide this through. And so this is gonna stay as one minus r, and this is gonna turn into like something, basically, you know, basically r star minus r. Okay, so, so you're, you're really just factoring out this gamma epsilon out here, and moving this over, and you can turn this into a proper quadratic form. Okay, it's, it's a little clunky to get there, and, and we're, we're we're a little short on time, so uh, we're gonna kind of do two or three steps in one there, but you eventually get this. Um, okay, uh, question. So now we are trying to get they say because we said so. Right at this point, we're saying yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, so we're gonna say okay, here we have a law of motion for r. Okay, and so like if this was. Um, you know, solo or whatever Ramsey, then we would say, okay, so this, you know, we have a, we have an initial condition um, and we know how K evolves. And so then we can, you know, so think, think about it. So we have an initial condition for K, we have a law of motion for K and we say, these are the dynamics and we eventually converge to steady state. Okay. So that's, that's in solo world and that, but then remember in Ramsey world, it was more like, okay, we have an initial condition for K. We kind of don't know what the initial condition for C is because that's a choice. And because of that instability, the saddle path instability in a Ramsey system, uh, that gave us exactly one C that we had to choose in order to get to steady state, okay? And here it's kind of the same thing, is that there is actually instability in the system, okay? Uh, and so the only way um, to, uh, to get things to kind of like work out without blowing up at some point is to set R exactly equal to R star right from the beginning. Okay, so so this is more of a Ramsey flavor because it's got in the instability that induces a unique outcome uh, and, a, and a fixed outcome. Okay, so um, and and it's, so so like it's like Ramsey if we didn't have capital. It's just we have C and therefore it's just a fixed outcome. Okay, so but let's let's um let's draw. Uh, okay, so hi, let's draw let's draw some axes. Okay, so drawing straight lines is extremely treacherous in this domain. Uh, graphing is. You know, you'll see. I'm not good at graphing it with a with a virtual pen like this, but we can at least use the ruler tool to draw proper axes. Okay, um, but actually, we want to have um, we want to have uh, axes that go positive and negative. Okay, so now here, um, what's this going to look like? Okay, so we know kind of like things things are happening here at uh, one. Oh, I'm still in the ruler tool. That's why. Um, we know things are happening here at one. Okay. 
uh, zero seems like a natural negative uh, uh, lower bound. Okay, and we know that r dot um, is zero at one. Okay, because uh, this thing here, this term here, is going to be zero. Okay. What else do we know? So there's r star. Okay, assume that. Um, let's see. So we're assuming that r star is less than one. So it actually is less than one. You can write this as like um, one over epsilon minus this thing here, um, and you can say epsilon is greater than one. So it's like something less than one minus something that's positive means. It's less than one. Okay, so we know that we know that r is going to be less than that r star is going to be less than one. So r star is some point in here. Okay, so r star usually is in the in the data is not uh, or like r itself is not huge in the data. So let's say it's it's not a huge number. Okay, so um, all right, so th those are the zero points. We know this is a quadratic. It's it's a quadratic form, right? So the question is and and. Uh, Question is which way is it facing? Okay, well we can see um, there's a minus sign here on the, the r squared term. It's going to have a minus. Okay, so it's going to be downward facing. All right. So uh, another way to think about it is if we're down here, right below r star, then this thing is negative and this thing is is positive. Okay, so here it's negative. If we're above r star, yeah, um, I think that's wrong. So uh, it should be the other way. So it should be that. Your higher discount rate means you put in this. So Daniel asked in the in the notes, it's it's gamma over rho versus rho over gamma. If you have a higher discount rate, you should um you should have less research. So it's it's it, I think that's that's a typo, and I'll I'll go through and, and fix that. But thanks, Dan. Um. So uh. Yeah. So in here, uh, r is greater than r star and less than one. So these are both positive. Um. And so it's going to be positive up here. Over here, I mean, we're we're kind of screwed anyway. So you know. But it would be negative uh, above there. So let's say it looks like this. Okay. So the the drawing. Oh no, I missed it. Okay. So th this is going to be a little bit of an ordeal. But let's say that I do this, and then oof. okay. So not you know not like fully continuously differentiable curve there. But we do what we can. Um, okay. So so there's going to be some quadratic form uh, here. It's going to pass through zero at r star and at one. Okay, so then the only thing we need to do is, and like, you know, it'll it actually just kind of blows through zero here. So, um, but we we can't physically go below zero. So, uh, so the only thing we're gonna do is, oh dear, consider what what are the dynamic what would be the dynamics if we were to not start at r star. Okay, so we know that if we start here, things are negative, and we would ride down this curve until we hit zero, and then. That doesn't, yeah, that's not, that's no good because we'd actually try to go below zero. So that's, that's sort of like, okay, we violated feasibility. Okay. We've tried to have negative researchers. Okay. Um, up here, if we start above R star, we're going to head along this curve like this. And you can probably figure out what's going to happen. We're eventually going to hit R equals one. Okay. So R equals one, that can be problematic uh, because that means that P is equal to zero. You're not doing any production. If you're not doing a production, you're not doing any consumption. And if you're not doing a consumption, your margin utility shoots off to infinity because you're not you're not a conditions. And that's going to be rise of the machines. There we go. Um, so that's going to be uh, that's going to be a violation there, right? So um, it's and I guess yeah, it would be a, it would be a violation of like the transversality condition. Um, uh, and yeah, so that that would be. Problematic. So um, I don't know if I worked it out in the notes. Um, yeah, I, I think I feel like I worked it out in, in a homework at, at some point in the past. But um, you can, if you're really ambitious, okay, uh, you can figure out what the local dynamics would be as you approach one and see how fast is uh, the um, let's see. So, yeah, you could you could figure out how fast the convergence would be, and by figuring out how the convergence would be, you could get an estimate for actually how is the transversality condition violated. Um, so, uh, yes. So, question one at R one is turns out transversality condition violated. Um, 
Yeah, so so basically, it's gonna it's gonna shoot your um, marginal utility to infinity, um, and I mean you have to, you know, we want to be like we need to you need to work out the rate how fast because because essentially if you look here, um, because you know as r gets to one, this derivative is actually getting smaller. So this is going to be an asymptotic convergence to one. Okay, you're never gonna hit one. Um, now you're gonna you can linearize this around one and look at basically this slope here will tell you uh the rate of convergence to one for r and then hence uh the rate at which p is going to zero okay um and then uh because because essentially if, if you if you think about okay so this this is getting a little bit into the weeds but actually we're out of time um i can talk about it next time but you, you can you can basically think about if you thought about it as as p instead of r it would look something like this around one, okay? Um, and so then your rate of convergence here is gonna be minus gamma over epsilon over epsilon minus one. You can map that into how fast uh, consumption is is tanking and hence how fast your your uh, margin utility is going up, macro baby. Um, and so uh, you can, with the, with the anodic condition, that's what gets you the blow up in marginal utility, okay? And uh, so then you just need to know exactly what, you know, what is your like CRA parameter, throw that on there um, and you're gonna get some rate here and then you plug that in the transversality condition and you'll see, you'll get a condition, right? Um, I can't remember if it's, if it's one of the condition, if it's a condition that's like, as long as rho is greater than N or something like that, then it's violated or if it's like you actually need a parametric condition, okay? Um, I can I can double check on that, but I, I believe it's something that always happens, okay? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so but that, yeah, so that's, you know, is a little bit of a sort of a rise in the machines, okay, we're gonna just go crazy with uh, research um, and, you know, what happens. Uh, so, but but at the end of the day, you do you do give up a lot of consumption, okay? So then let, let's say, you know, we're, we've ruled that out, okay, this one violates feasibility. There's really only one choice left and that's R star right here, okay? So we're gonna choose R star and we're gonna stay there um, from the beginning, okay? Um, all right, uh, so then, um, Okay, so that, so so we're we're pretty much out of time. I know we had to, to eat up a little bit of time at the beginning talking about stuff, but that's that's fine. We can we can keep moving. So so let me just give you a little bit of info. Uh, next time, so we're gonna um, we're gonna go through the social planner. You know, I realized that we never. I don't think we ever did social planner for Ramsey. I completely forgot about that. Um, it turns out that it's not that hard, and it turns out that Ramsey is efficient, so it's not super interesting. But we can. Maybe possible. We can go back to that if we want, um, but I think for now, uh, what we're gonna do is, uh, let's see, let's switch. What we can do is uh, head over to um, the social planner, okay, for uh, this this kind of model. Um, the, maybe we did it in a problem set. Okay, mil okay. Let me go check, double check that. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I just yeah, I don't have a strong memory of it, but you know, so you. It's similar, we're, we're going to be solving a Hamiltonian for the social planner here, uh, given sort of the physical setup of the problem. Um, that one, you get the same thing, kind of like you can do it in full dynamic mode and you conclude that you actually just choose one thing at the end. Um, and we'll see that there's a, uh, relative to the social planner, there's an underinvestment in research in the, uh, there. Okay, so it was, it was in a recitation. Okay, so that's good. That's good that Yu Chen did that. Um, Okay, so then you, we'll see that there's an underinvestment. And then eventually we'll move on to, to Schumpeter and all of that. Uh, okay, so uh, we got a question. So with the dynamics for R, can we say we don't have stability? So um, we can, yeah, I mean, um, it's the same as Ramsey, okay? It's, it's we, we don't have stability in that particular equation that describes R. Um, and because of that, we have exactly one choice for R, but um, we do we do have stability in the sense that if you make a mistake and you choose the wrong R, you're not going to be stuck on that path forever. And just because of that one little error, you have to, you know, do this rise in the machines thing and go to R equals one. That you know you, you just you would correct the next time and 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 so on. So it's it's not real sort of outcome stability. It's it's instability in the system. Okay. Um, okay, we got another question also, what about recitations? Yu Chang will do it on the Zoom the usual time. Um, yes, so he'll be, he'll be doing it on Zoom the usual time. Um, 
And then for office hours, I'll do Zoom as well. So um, actually, yeah, I mean, um, so I'm going to do office hours tomorrow. Do you guys, or like someone should come to office hours or like ag someone should aggregate opinions in some way and we should talk about it office hours tomorrow. Okay. That way, and, and we'll be, I'll be using Zoom. Okay. We can do it on Zoom. Um, I will send you my Zoom ID uh, and I'll make the meeting uh, there. And then we can talk about w what should we do? Should we switch, just switch to Zoom? You know, say, okay, we did, we tried Twitch. That's, that's cool. Uh, let's, let's try Zoom. But it would be cool if some set of people could come to office hours. And if they do come, they should attempt also to aggregate opinions um, and so on. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, independently, if you can or can't come to office hours, you know, just send me an email saying like, you know, I like this, I like that. I'm not married to Twitch. Okay. So um, I'm happy. I just want to figure out what's best. And I wanted to try one little bit of experimentation uh, to see how things work. Um, but yeah, so just, just send me your, your honest feedback, which, which one you think would be better and kind of why that is uh, compared to other stuff. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, uh, just be the guy says, I like the screen name, by the way. Um, it's the initial condition in C0 in Ramsey. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, in Ramsey, there's only one C0 you can choose to get to the steady state and to avoid viol either violating Inata or violating feasibility. It's the only one you can choose. And that's and that's the same thing here. Uh, you have to choose R star in order to avoid those, those outcomes. Okay. Um, all right. So... Okay, um, I think that's it for now. Okay, I don't have anywhere to go, so I mean, we don't have to go, but I don't want to keep you guys too long.